do a lot of the times people jump on forums and they'll have learned from someone who set it up 10 years ago that they set their lash three thou looser than the recommended lash setting and that went better that's that's not good advice at all Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we're joined by Thomas from Calford Cams right here in New Zealand. Our aftermarket camshafts are an obvious path to go down when you're trying to extract more power out of just about any engine. However, there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of misunderstanding about selecting a cam that's going to be right for your application. And one of the most common things I see people doing when they're choosing cams is simply going for the biggest, baddest cam that a particular manufacturer offers and then finding that A, it doesn't actually work in their other way standard engine combination and B, it turns what was a nice car to drive on the street into an absolute dog. So there's a lot that goes into choosing a cam that's going to suit your particular engine combination and actually give you what you want in terms of drivability, be it a modified street car or perhaps you're building a drag car, maybe a road race car. There's a lot of differences and subtle aspects to those different applications that need to be taken in when selecting your cam. Cam. In this episode we dive deep into the world of camshaft design and we talk about the aspects of cam terminology that you may have heard and maybe didn't understand such as duration, advertised duration, lift, lobe separation angle just to name a few. We talk about the different ways that aftermarket camshafts can be made as well from the likes of a billet, uh, from a cast core, even from grinding down the base circle on an existing factory cam or building up the lobes and we'll talk about why we would choose one over the other and the pros and cons. We also talk in this episode about cam timing the importance of the cam timing to making sure that your cam offers the results that you should be expecting and just as importantly make sure that you don't end up with your pistons hitting your valves. Before we get into our interview with Thomas, just a quick introduction for those who are new to the podcast. High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialize in teaching people how to build high performance engines, how to tune aftermarket and factory engine management systems. We also cover motorsport wiring, race, driver education, car setup, data analysis and fabrication. Irrelevant to today's topic, we do have a course specifically about installing and degreeing an aftermarket camshaft. This is our how to degree a cam course. This is a very misunderstood topic, even among uh, a lot of really well-educated mechanics. It's not something that you know, necessarily you're going to be doing if you're used to working on factory engines but as I just mentioned getting the cam degreed properly to the manufacturer's spec card is absolutely critical to get the performance out of the cam and ensure reliability. This particular course will give you all of the terminology some of which we talk about in today's interview and you'll learn a step-by-step -step process that you can apply to degreeing a cam in any engine regardless whether it's a simple pushrod V8 or maybe it's a quad cam V12 it absolutely does not matter. We also include a library of worked examples where you can watch the step-by-step -step process being applied from start to finish. We'll put a link to that specific course in the show notes and as a podcast listener you can use the coupon code PODCAST75 to get $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course. And with that how to degree a CAM course that is $49 US dollars so you're going to get that for free. Again, link in the description. All right, enough with our introduction. Let's get into our chat with Thomas now. All right, welcome to the podcast, Thomas. Thanks for joining us today. Now, I want to get started as we usually do by just finding out a little bit more about your background, how you got into the automotive industry in the first place. So can you fill us in a little bit? Uh, so I grew up on a little farm down south by the Catlins. Then uh, it was just a, as a kid, always enjoyed mechanical systems and engineering and, you know, the, the tractors and, and machinery and that sort of thing. And then ended up after school coming up to uh, the University of Canterbury here for engineering. Uh, did a year of that and realized I wanted to be um, in a much more practical uh, role than what that uh, style usually is. So did my trade course with Air New Zealand and that was a real good hands-on course. 
and then from there um got a job here at Calford uh seeing seeing the advert up for a machinist role started in here grinding camshafts on a manual grinder and after a couple of years of that moved on to running the CNC and then uh running the uh research and design development department here at Calford along with a yeah real cool team of guys building camshafts and making race cars and jet boats go fast basically okay that's um that's a pretty quick progression straight into to the role so let's just sort of jump back a little bit you mentioned you did an engineering degree at university of canterbury so does what you learned in that degree get put into action with your current role i mean you mentioned you wanted a more practical hands-on sort of approach but yeah i'm just interested with the design and development side of things, there's the computer skills and the CAD skills that you learn, as well as with uh, designing a, a lobe and looking at um, the various lift and velocity and acceleration. It's basically your your um, calculus that you learn at school. Actually, I've, I'm one of the few people that, you know, they ask at school, who, when are you ever going to use this? And I'm like on a daily basis using this exact principles. Um, yeah, to look at the various characteristics of how a valve train is going to behave. Okay, so it's good to know that at least point one percent of the population out there are actually using calculus. So for the rest of us, not so useful. It's it's very much a a, a very practical application of applied mathematics. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you would say that you basically have to be a mathematical genius to design and develop camshafts. Oh, I wouldn't go quite that far, but yeah, it's uh, it does require a bit of uh, a a bit of understanding of how how that works. But it's, for the most part, we've got good visuals as well that you can you can really get that um, for, through the software. You can see well what okay. you're doing. So um, it's been it's been cool. It's been right, good. To we're going to dive more obviously into the camshaft design and the software that you just mentioned there as we go through this. But before before we sort of go a bit deeper, the the time you spent in New Zealand. I mean, I I. I am a pilot myself. I, I don't fly for airlines, but um, I haven't seen too many camshafts in a turbine jet engine. So what specifically were you doing for Air New Zealand? No, so I did the mechanical trade course and that we we went through, um, so you learn all of your riveting and sheet forming, and um, but then you do a mechanical course as well. So we got an old V-Dub Beetle Flat 4, which is very similar to the Lycoming and Continental engines that the R22s and uh, like the little Piper aircraft run and we stripped that completely down and cleaned it up and then put it all back together and had to put it on the test engine and have it fire up and that was one of your your courses that you had to do as a team of two um, so that was real cool for some hands-on bit of mechanical engineering and yeah throughout the course you learn you learn a bit of aircraft grade wiring um, as well and yeah, those fabrication techniques and mechanical aptitude you picked up has been yeah helpful moving on and realizing that I did definitely enjoy that mechanical side of things and then getting a job here with with Calford and knowing it was a yeah the right sort of way I wanted to go. Having having the opportunity to talk to a handful of sort of aircraft engineers over over the years, uh, do you think the sort of a, a benefit in learning from that particular industry because Obviously, with with the aircraft, if something fails, you, you don't get to pull across to the side of the sky and get out and wait for a tow truck to come and fix it. So there's a, I believe there's going to be a higher level of precision uh, and and kind of uh, double checking, I guess, that's required to, to really ensure that everything is 100% and the chances of failure are absolutely minimal. I don't think we see that in, in the automotive industry. And I mean, of course, not everywhere, but in general, I, I think it's, it's maybe not seen as so mission critical. It's a bit of both a higher level of QC and and procedure. Um, their disciplines are, are much higher, but also they tend to design with a a, a good window of um, safety. So you've got you've got that to work with as, as much as tight as you have to be. You're hundreds of percentage over how strong it needs to be and how safe it needs to be. So they do it well for both both ends, you know. Um, but yeah, that discipline that discipline was was great to learn for actually having to follow stuff to the book and if you missed one step that was that they just 
you don't get signed off. Yeah, I think discipline was probably the term I was I was struggling to to actually find there. I mean, for me, going through my private pilot's license and flying general aviation aircraft like uh, Piper Cherokees and Cessna 172s with the Lycoming like, or Continental engines, it always frustrated me, obviously, with my automotive background. I mean, these, these engines, the technology is not there. They, they rev to sort of 2,500 RPM. They are not economical, they don't make much power. So for me, that's a frustration. The one and only thing that they do seem to do though is go just about forever. They they are reliable and of course, you know, if you're if you're stacking your priorities for an aircraft, that reliability really does need to to come before everything else. But we digress. Let's get back to cars now. I'm interested. Do you personally have a passion for for race cars, for for road cars, or is it all for the customers of these days? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I my main passion is for engineering, mechanical systems. Um, uh, so I've, I loved aircrafts and and that sort of thing growing up, and and cars and race cars, and just seeing what the human mind can come up with for a solution for another engineering problem when you're coming at from all the different directions that you can. I've got uh, in terms of my own car, I've got an old Mitsubishi Sigma that I'm doing up. So <laughs> some people would say it's not the most exciting thing, but it's been a a labour of the last you know five eight years or something slowly building that up and and building my engine to go with it so i'd, I'd absolutely uh yeah enjoy cars and enjoy race cars and but haven't haven't yet had my own completed race car project to get too excited about but that's happening that's in the that's in the works that does seem to be the way a lot of projects go and i mean i think it would be very unusual to uh, get to the position you're in without some level of passion for for motorsport. Uh, you know, I think the two kind of go hand in hand. And moving into to camshafts, I think this is sort of one of those areas where uh, a lot of enthusiasts kind of get confused. There's a, a lot of misinformation out there, particularly if you're on forums or Facebook groups about what cams do what. And I, I think there's sort of a lot of maybe smoke and mirrors around this industry as well. I, I know one of the approaches that seems sensible if you're uninitiated and don't know much about cams is, all right, I'm building my engine up, so I want a camshaft profile for this engine. Go to the relevant camshaft manufacturer's catalogue and just scroll all the way down to the bottom and get the biggest, baddest, ugliest cam with the biggest numbers and, and think that that's going to set you up for the best results. Now, as we'll find out today, obviously that's that's not the case and camshaft design and specifications are very specific to an application and get that wrong and you're just going to end up with essentially a slug that that's horrible to drive is that is that about right at a very high level yeah that's about the case and and we do get that uh, quite often people just want the biggest one or the lumpiest one or the uh, yeah they want to uh, have that that number or that advertised number to be able to spout that they've put in their car uh, whereas in reality that's not going to be a good uh, mix for their engine and if you go too big you're going to find that you're just wasting power out the exhaust instead of putting it on the crank where it wants to be and yes it'll be loud but it'll be slow and you'll actually lose power and efficiency for, for zero gain really so yeah the the camshaft typically for a lot of locations it's better to aim for the slightly on the low side in the camshaft and slightly on the high side on the turbo um, and that can be sort of the safe way if you don't know what you're doing okay and, and I mean, most people with without a massive race team budget don't have the ability to go through and try four or five different cam profiles and maybe four or five different turbos in in their combination. So it, it is a case of making educated decisions about these these parts and and relying on advice from the likes of of yourself. Now, before we go too much further into this, though, I think it's probably good to sort of come back and, and get a high-level overview of the camshaft's job. And, and I mean, obviously, on face value, it seems pretty simple. It's there to, to open and close the intake and the exhaust valves, which is fine. There's a few bits and pieces between the camshaft and the actual valve, usually, that we'll talk about as well. But there's also a bit of terminology around the, the camshaft. Now, here, obviously, the podcast, we don't have the ability to have some nice graphics that really simply explain this, but we'll, we'll do our best, and I want to sort of go through through some of the the terminology and we'll start with timing and cam timing specifically so uh, obviously getting the the cam 
into the engine is one thing, but it's, it's also quite critical whereabouts the cam is timed relative to the crankshaft rotation so that the intake and exhaust valves are opening and closing at the points that they're designed to. So what, what does that actually mean? What are the numbers we're looking at here? Yeah, yeah, you touched on that well there. The timing is is there to control the four valve events, intake opening, intake closing, exhaust opening, exhaust closing. And when we're designing a camshaft, that's where we'll start. Those four events basically set up the characteristics for how the engine's going to breathe and how it's going to behave. Uh, we start with intake valve closing typically. Uh, if we if we pull that a bit earlier, we're going to have more dynamic compression, but less time for the intake charge to actually get in there. And in a sense, uh, it, it suits lower RPM and better torque. Whereas if you push that intake valve closing a bit later, you're going to have uh, more chance for air at high RPM where it's got that ram effect from flowing in fast to, to actually get in there, even though the valve's closing after bottom dead centre, uh, that mass of air will keep moving in. And so you start setting up these events and your timing number is after you've set your intake valve closing and your intake valve opening, just the degrees between those two points um, is going to be your advertised duration or your advertised timing, uh, which will be something like 272 degrees, which you'll hear on a, you know, a typical turbo grind. I've got 272 cams. Let, let's talk about that number in a moment. But before we do there, just just what you mentioned there, I think, again, if you've, you've not dealt with these before, it's, it's hard to get that concept that air actually has a mass to it. So because of that, there is that tendency to get that ram effect with basically the, the stack of air in the intake port uh, at high RPM. It, it's got that momentum. It wants to continue into the, the uh, cylinder, even a, against a sort of a small amount of pressure in the cylinder. So the, there's an advantage there at higher RPM from holding the intake valve open a little yep. bit longer. Yeah, and we can, with a good port and a well-designed valve and the system System, uh, at RPM, you can see, you know, 120, 130% volumetric efficiency out of those when they're really going on song and you've got the rest of your tuned lengths happening as well. So being a fluid in a pipe like that, it's it's acting like a, a musical instrument and causing those harmonic vibrations up and down the length of the tube. And when we're, des- especially for this is ENA stuff, um, but that's, you know, the best place to start when designing a camshaft, uh, you're going to time those events so that those pressure waves uh, reflect back and assist each other. Um, and that's where you get your, your power band in a high revving, naturally aspirated engine. Um, and then and then the second thing you're going to look at there is your exhaust valve opening. So you're pulling your, put, when, when you're going to let your gases off the piston in a high RPM engine, you've, you're going to want to open it earlier because you get a signal lag. Uh, it's a you know it's a gas again so you open the valve and it, it's not going to react to that for 10 20 degrees depending on your rpm you know and so you want to keep that pressure on the piston for as long as possible while also not waiting so long that you've got no energy to get the gases out the exhaust and yeah it's a it's a balancing act it's a lot of learning and know-how to work out based on the setup and based on the the rest of the engine, how you're going to want those events to to, to act together and, and where, you, where your restrictions are. Sometimes you can only package an exhaust so well, so you've just got to have more timing in it to get those gases out because they're not going to flow easily. All right. I, I think on face value, what, what we would have assumed is that for the likes of our intake valve opening, we would simply open that valve right bang smack at top dead centre when the piston is about to begin the intake stroke where it's moving from the top of the stroke to the bottom of the stroke. Yep. That would make sense, yep. right? And then, of course, <laughs> we would then close the intake valve right at the bottom of the stroke before it starts moving up on the compression stroke. And exactly the same way, we would open the exhaust valve at the bottom of the power stroke just as the piston's about to go back up, and then we'd close it at the top. Now, you've already sort of alluded to that's absolutely not the case. No. And is this to do with that tuned effect plus the inertia that the mass of of the air has? Yeah, yeah, it's it's to do with that. And it's to do with you want to actually um, let that intake charge start flowing into the chamber while the exhaust gases are still heating out. We call that event overlap. And that's where you've got your um, intake and exhaust open at the same time. And the energy of the exhaust still leaving the pipe and out the headers is going to suck some intake in 
and in an ideal system suck a little bit out past the exhaust valve and then we get that reflective wave from the exhaust pipe push that back into the chamber just as the exhaust valve closes and then we've got a real nice homogenous charge in there that's going to have no exhaust gases left or the minimal amount for that cylinder head design okay and then we and then it carries on with the, the intake event with the piston moving down the bore now and yeah so intake valve closing and those overlap events that uh, sets it up for that for that scavenge event, which can be absolutely massive at the right RPM. But once again, when you got engines that you've tuned to do this, you're going to find real peaky low numbers at down through three four thousand RPM, and really be sitting on that. It's going to be at that high RPM that they come on song, and that's when you get you'll see the the big drag cars with their individual intakes with the standoff cloud at idle. You know, because they're that scavenge event, the exhaust is coming back up into the chamber and it's not until they're at rpm that they really come on song but designing a camshaft for that is why same switching back to what you said before why when you you don't want to go too big if you're not set up for it this is a a a bit off the the topic of terminology but it's probably a good time to to dive off into this because again i think it's that uninitiated sort of idea that you know bigger is better and, and what you've just been talking about hopefully has is, is already started to solidify that we can't look at the camshaft in isolation. No. It, it has to be considered as a complete package, particularly you know, naturally aspirated engines clearly are more sensitive to all of these elements. So let's, let's not worry about forced induction for the moment. But you've got the, the intake trumpet, the length of that, as you mentioned, that has to be tuned or there is a tuning effect that comes from getting that right, which can help get more air into the cylinder. We've got that scavenging effect from the exhaust system and that really comes down as well to the design of the header, how that's been specified and, and fabricated. And then of course on top of that there's likes of the the head flow, so port work, uh, valve size. So all of these these elements come in into play. Which is why one one of the other questions we get, not specifically related to camshaft profiles, is you know I've got my factory engine with a seven thousand rpm rev limit. Can I rev that to ten thousand rpm and make more power? And I mean, if you've just looked at the power curve on a dyno from that stock engine, the clear answer is no, because by the factory rev limit, we're already seeing the torque's well and truly falling off a cliff, and it's just going to continue to dive. And our power is normally nosed over, probably at least 500 rpm earlier. So if we go to 10,000 rpm with making out making relevant changes, all you're going to do, other than breaking a whole lot of bits, is make next to no power. So then it comes into getting, in order to actually get that engine to perform at 10,000 RPM, what we need to do is basically make the head flow at that higher RPM range and then work in with a camshaft profile that, that works with, with those parts. So I just wanted to clarify that. It's, it's not the ability to look at a part in isolation. Everything has to be selected. And I assume you're dealing with your customers, particularly with these high-end projects like we've just been talking about there, uh, to make sure that all of those other parts are up to the task so that the camshaft can actually perform. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And we've got a, a real good team of guys here with some good technical knowledge that will absolutely uh, help when people have those questions and a good form online too for when you want to put all that data in and and we can help you pick a suitable camshaft or tell you actually that is not going to work for your engine or that package just what you're asking it to do is physically not possible. And uh, ideally, if I was, when I'm designing something, the camshaft will be the It'll sort of be the last bit of the equation. You work out what your other limiting factors are and then design the cam that's going to best suit that setup. Um, but also having known how that valve train is set up and what it what its limiting factors are too can give you a good point to, you can obviously design an engine that I want this to do. You know, I've done everything to suit 13,000 RPM and all of my all of my runners and everything can, and my piston, my crank can do that and your valve train can't. It's... I'm not going to be able to do that with a cylinder head. Um, so you want to know that you're not over-engineering for a, an engine that essentially has its own limitations. So there you're talking about a valve train design that no matter essentially what you did with the cam and the valve springs, etc., just could not sustain that sort of RPM reliably. Yeah, yeah some of them just can't. Okay. Some of those single, like so your single overhead cam stuff, that you're not going to be able to do it. It's not going to have a, a big fat rocker arm like that. It just is not going to be able to handle those stresses at that high RPM. But yeah, that's when you can look at bespoke stuff or 
swap your cylinder head out, find something better. Um, but yeah, you try and uh, you try and start uh, with a package that you know what your goal is, and then work out if you can build that around that engine, and then yeah, the camshaft and the events that we we're talking about is sort of the last thing that you get right once you know, you know, oh, I had to have a it was a restricted class, or uh, yeah, I couldn't package my exhaust the way I had to. The turbo only fits this size. All that sort of thing. Just coming back to the online form that you just mentioned, yeah, what what sort of information does a, a customer need to be able to provide ideally? And again, let's just stick to the sort of high and naturally aspirated format for the moment. Yeah, what sort of information is required in order for you to be able to do the, the job as well as possible? Uh, typically, we'll ask them what application that's going to be running in, whether it's rally or drag or a street thing that they're going to be driving. And then we want to know uh, what fuel they're going to be running because that's important for how the gases are going to want to behave um, through the combustion cycle and that can help determine what size lobes you're going to need. Uh, and then what RPM and obviously we're talking about naturally aspirated, but also we'll look at specifically for naturally aspirated, the chassis, like the weight of the vehicle it's going to be in and the gear ratios. Uh, so we can see if it's going to need to be a, a tight uh, a tight RPM band that it's going to want to run in or whether we can actually, we have to go a bit wider. In which case we'll design the cam to suit because if you've got something that's got a, a tall gear ratio and you know f- uh, just four gears, we're going to not want to give him a 1000 RPM range that is that his engine's going to run on, uh, or he's never going to get out of the corners. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And obviously, if you're going to be using a wide ratio in your gear and, and fall off that sort of power band, uh, it doesn't matter how much the peak power is if it's not actually getting there and it's not usable. No. In, in terms of other things like you, the the actual head flow, exhaust design, and things like trumpet length, those don't come into play here. Is, is that something you're sort of working backwards and forwards with the customer on? For, for most of the guys that are going to approach us through, uh, through that form are going to be looking for a, a catalogue option. We have, a, we have a much more in-depth one that we would go into for that if it's a, a big circuit racer or something. And, and then, yeah, you're going to ask for what their what harmonic they're aiming for in their tuned length intakes and what valve size they're going to run and usually they'll have a flow bench sheet to, to supply for us too. And once you're there, yeah, you're going to start designing a custom thing, starting with these valve timings and and, and lift right from scratch okay. for, for something like that. They're typically not going to be going to the catalogue anymore. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just, just something that I wanted to mention here, this actually was a Calford car that I, I tuned years and years and years ago for the old owner of Calford, which was the uh, little Honda Drag Civic, and uh, yes. I think it was a H twenty two A from memory in it. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, we've still got okay. it. It's uh, it's getting a, a second cylinder head ported as we speak. I think right. Uh, the the bit that sticks in mind, and why I raise this is, I just want to talk about how sensitive these high and naturally aspirated engines are to something seemingly as insignificant as is what I'm about to tell you about, which is an, a part of the exhaust system. Uh, I had that car for a, for an ECU swap, which really doesn't matter too much for the the purpose of the story. But I'd run it up on my dyno and got a baseline so that I could get some kind of comparison once I'd done this ECU swap and uh, we swapped in the ECU and one of the first tasks you have to do of course is set the base timing and uh, to do that I, I was in there with a the timing light right down, down by the crank pulley and because this is a, a dedicated drag car it, it awkwardly had the headers basically exiting right out essentially in my face. So what I did yep. Just so that I wasn't getting exhaust gas, uh, some pretty noxious exhaust gas blowing straight in my face while I was doing this with the timing light, as I temporarily tacked, I think it was a, maybe a 45 degree piece of, of a U-bend just onto the exhaust tip. That was all it was. It was probably no more than a few inches long and just through 45 degrees. Same diameter and it was just tacked in like three places so it wasn't fully welded. And uh, anyway, because it was convenient, I left that on the, the engine while I, I started tuning it. And when I'd completed the tune, it just it wasn't stacking up. And an overlay directly with the baseline, the entire shape of the power curve was just dramatically different. And you, know, you wouldn't expect to necessarily see that, you know, tune related, you're probably still going to follow in the, the same broad shape because that's essentially the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So I sort of went back, scratched my head and thought, well, shit, the only thing I've done here is, is tack this little extension on. So I cut through my three little tack welds, ran it up, and the whole shape of the power curve was back to where it was on the baseline. So I 
unrelated specifically to your to, to our conversation, but just how sensitive these naturally aspirated engines can be to something uh, like that. It is really important, particularly when you're trying to do a, a back-to-back comparison. No, that that's absolutely true, and I suspect it was the um, that scavenge event that we were talking about earlier, where that pressure wave comes from the tip of the exhaust there, and having a 45 instead of a a, a 90 to the to the flow of gases would have been essentially like a wee baloney cut, where you get you know 12 or 13 mini waves instead of one big one, um, and that would have changed it from being a single RPM it was looking at to a more broad yep. torque curve. I'd I'd suspect. But not having that peak that it had, yeah, 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 it would cha- it would change it quite considerably, yeah, and and those are aspects that uh, once you get to the to the level that yeah you're doing a big naturally aspirated thing, you're looking at all those little fine details, and and trying to yeah really tune all those out. Mm. This is one of those things that if I had not seen it with my own eyes on my own dyno. I, I would have, I wouldn't have believed it. It was, it was that dramatic for such a subtle change. Anyway, we'll get back to to our terminology because we didn't really get too far through this. So when we were talking about um, timing events on the cam, we've talked about what 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 you're you're really meaning there, sort of intake valve opening and closing, exhaust valve opening and closing. But there's also different ways of specifying the the cam timing, and and generally we've got sort of advertised, we've got uh, lift at fifty. They are fifty thousandths of an inch, or or one millimeter, if we want to do the the metric equivalent, or it's not quite the equivalent, which is actually important here. So, what, why, why do we use these three different ways of sort of specifying some of the the valve events? Uh, it's it's partially historic. It's the way that the the you know the the pioneers of cam grinding, like Harvey Crane and stuff, they came up with ways just to, to spec how a how a cam would be described and. Once it becomes the standard nomenclature, it's just hard to it's hard to shake off, which is why even some a lot of the old boys go into one mill instead of fifty thou. Um, it's a big challenge at times. Um, but so basically, what it is is telling you once you set your cam timing, uh, where those events are, are going to be. So on our cam card, we'll have our advertised duration of uh, three hundred degrees, say. And then it'll say that the intake valve opening is going to be 30 degrees before top dead center. And that way, when you go to time up your engine, and the best way to do it is to get that dial indicator on the retainer if it's at the valve if it's valve timing, and see that the that's where that intake valve opening event happens. You get you'll always get dwell and lag over the nose. So looking at the intake center line number, which talks about peak lift is is a good quick check but it's not near as accurate as seeing those advertised timing numbers or at one mil numbers which are uh, just a basically a, a similar thing but they get you away from the ramps they get you up onto the flank of the lobe uh, so when we talk about ramps we're talking about the the lash ramp uh, down at the end for uh, seating and take up of your of your valve but that gets you up onto the flank where the valve is well and truly open you've got no lash in the system and it's going to be very consistent you'll be able to come around on your timing wheel and see those same numbers to within half a degree every time and set it up and and exactly to the cam guard Uh, so just a really good check to see that your timings are in the right place as well as they're a good indication of how big your lobe is so once you get your head around you're at 50 cam numbers and know that you know, two two twenty to two thirty, sort of a good street grind, and uh, your two forties to two sixties are your big racing cams. Then you can just see at a glance that oh, this is going to be much too big for my application, or I'm kind of in the ballpark, which is yeah why that that's uh, hung around and been a yeah just a useful number to look at. Now you you kind of talk through this, but I just want to come back and just really sort of crystallize this. You know, most people would think, well, you know, if I've got 300 degree advertised duration, you know, you, you could time off those those numbers basically like, well, let's look at when the intake valve first starts to, to move off its seat and, and that's our intake valve opening, which I mean, of course, yes, that is the case, but we don't do that. We instead time at 50 thou lift. And you sort of explained that's because we're on the flank of the cam there. We, we're getting nice, consistent results. And and the bit that's it's easy to overlook is if you're trying to find that point with your dial gauge where that that valve very first starts to open because of that take up of the lash etc. It, it's very hard to get true consistency, and we might see from from one engine cycle to the next that point might change a few degrees. Correct? 
Yeah, yeah, and in a in a perfect world, your your valve train and your system is going to be infinitely stiff, but that's not the case, and so you're you're going to start lifting that valve, and your rock is going to deform slightly, and your spring like the, you got springs that are 150 pounds on that seat. It actually takes some lash out of the system, not just the lash like your your valve clearance, but your cam journals are going to push down slightly, and your everything's going to move a little bit. So that can be three or four degrees of error where you've got dwell, where you've started, the cam started to push, but the valve hasn't started to move yet. Okay, cool. I think we've got that clarified. The other thing uh, you mentioned there was lo- uh, the lobe center line, and you know, that's one of the specifications for the cam timing on your cam card. But timing to that that lobe center line is is difficult. You sort of mentioned dwell over the the nose of the cam, which uh, obviously doesn't necessarily mean too much if you haven't actually seen that. So uh, it's kind of no different really to finding true top dead center with a dial indicator or something down a, a spark plug hole. You know, trying to find that absolute point where the piston is at the the very top of the stroke. You can move the crankshaft backwards and forwards probably five degrees or so and you really won't see that dial indicator move so when we're trying to find TDC the technique we use there is we'll actually use a positive stop or something stop the piston a little bit down from TDC or maybe use our dial indicator and measure 50th hour before TDC on each side of rotation and then we know uh, TDC is in exactly that that location we split the difference uh, now that that is a, a technique that some people use to degree a cam as well rather than looking at the opening and closing events uh, they'll take uh, maybe 50 thou below peak lift each side of the of, of peak lift split the difference and you can use that as the the center line now that's not really the the preferred technique although it'll get you close can you explain to us why that might not be perfect in all, all situations um, yeah, you you could you could use something like that. It's not something I've heard of very much, but the the thing there is, if you wanted to use that technique, essentially you could then work out where your valve center line is relative to uh, TDC. But those numbers aren't going to be anywhere on your cam card, so you're going to have to work it out yourself. And uh, you you risk the valve motion not necessarily being a symmetric motion, which a lot of modern engines we it will typically aim for something close to symmetric, but uh, in, 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 in quite a few cases, actually having the valve motion a bit more aggressive on opening or closing uh, can be beneficial to a system. And so when we spec our timings as a cam manufacturer, uh, we'll tell you where to put them at one mil lift because that's where the, va- you know, anywhere below one mil lift, you're, you're in the signal lag area anyway, and it's a chunk above that that really matters uh, for your timings. And... If if you happen to be like a five or six degree split up around the nose, you're going to be uh, maybe 10, 15 degrees out down at those one mil numbers because it's not actually symmetrical and it's not like every old flat tap of V8 where they were. Yeah, that, that's the part I really wanted to kind of focus on. I think that on, on face value, the assumption would be that that cam lobe is symmetrical, but as you've, you know, as you've clarified there, it's not. So that's why using that technique is going to get you close but not necessarily uh, right where you you need to be. Now when we're comparing numbers here between, I mean it, it seems to be pro- predominantly the uh, JDM manufacturers of cams will specify because they work in metric duration numbers in, in one millimeter lift uh, whereas everywhere else in the world it, it's 50 thou which the numbers are close but not quite if, if my math is right I think 50 thou is about 1.27 millimeters is that sound about right that's correct yeah so so a, a duration number at, at 50 thou of lift for exactly the same cam profile that therefore is going to be a smaller number than if we were measuring duration at one millimeter yes the duration at one mil will typically be bigger a lot of our a lot of the time too we'll have the at cam will have at 50 because the V8 stuff and uh, your old push rod stuff, they're going to be looking at what the lift is doing and of, often not actually looking at what the valve's doing after the rocker because they can just drop down the push rod tube there. And that's a, a more convenient way to time it with the head still off. Whereas with your modern overhead cam stuff, you're going to be looking at the valve and the actual valve motion. And in that case, we just find one mil lift is what most of the dials read out and you're working in mils of lift for the valve and, and everything else. So it just saves the confusion. Well, all I, all I wanted to really sort of get out of that is just understanding the numbers that you're looking at because it can be very misleading if you're comparing 
or any values for that matter on a cam card at one millimeter of lift versus a different cam where it's it's specified at fifty thou. Correct? They're, they're just they're not the same. Yeah, yeah. So there'll be there'll be about ten degrees in it usually on a typical uh, for for the aggression of a cam. There'll be yeah, approximately like six to ten degrees between fifty and one mil, which yeah yeah they're this actually the exact same size cam. So if we've got a a camshaft that's yeah two thirty at one mil, it'll be about 222 at 50. Okay. Now, just because you've also just mentioned it with your example with the push rod V8 being able to time the, the cam uh, with the heads off, which is, is nice and convenient, and why you're then looking at camshaft numbers versus valve numbers. And I mean, people listening might be sort of thinking to themselves at this point, well, why would the lift at the cam lobe be different to the lift at the valve? So can you just talk us through why that's the case? Uh, yeah, well, on a conventional push rod, you're going to have a, a rocker ratio or a rocker at the top that trans, uh, transforms your push rod motion to your valve motion. And they're typically 1.5 to 1.8 ratio. So if you've got 300 lift at the cam, you'll have about 500 at the valve total lift. And timing wise, it relates exactly to what the cam's up to though. So you can time them in knowing what you're doing at the cam and then bolt your other parts on and know that the valve's behaving relatively to what you told it to do whereas in your overhead cam engines yes some of them still have slippers and rockers like a rb30 or a h series so they've got the rocker ratio to multiply by but a lot of engines are obviously just your your uh, flat tappet bucket style where there's there's no rocker ratio they're just one to one in that case we can just have a one-to-one -one valve motion and all it does is subtract, subtracts your lash if it's got some and isn't hydraulic. Yeah I think it's just important to understand that there's obviously a, a lot of different designs of valve train and having that rocker multiplication factor in there it is quite common so just understanding that that's an element. Yeah and it's important you read the cam manufacturers specs and make sure you know where they've given those numbers for whether they're at the cam or at the valve or or yeah, uh, at the lifter sometimes, and, and how that relates to how you need to measure them and set them up in your engine. And for some cases, it can be quite a cumbersome thing to do. And like getting a little a bent foot around underneath a, a rocker can be really tricky to get right, but it's, it is the what you have to do to get it right. Yep. All right, next term, term that I want to dive into, LSA or lobe uh, separation angle. Can you, can you talk us through what that uh, refers to? Yeah, so lobe separation is essentially the degrees between the intake valve at peak lift and the exhaust valve at peak lift. Your intake center line and exhaust center line will be relative to TDC, and then your lobe separation, to work it out, is just the average between those two numbers. So a wider lobe separation is going to have uh, less overlap and less, and less scavenge and typically be suited for that wider RPM and like towing cams, whereas a, a tighter lobe separation is going to have, yeah, that that larger overlap event when it's going to be a lumpier idle and better for better suited for the higher RPM. But also that obviously factors into how big both those lobes are. So you're moving your your four valve events around, and then they set the the lobe separation by by proxy. You know, it's a, it's a, it's the same as your center line numbers where they're a good indication. Once you got your head around a few different packages, but it's as a number is is very relative to the to the rest of the system. So it's sort of something that comes out in the wash. You do the rest of your design and then go, oh, I've got a lobe separation of 112, or that's what it's going to want to have. Okay. In terms of the the cam design on, on a push rod style single cam, that that lobe separation angle is obviously sort of baked in during manufacture there's there's no ability to, to to change that yeah and it's a well-known thing because once you've got your lobes that exist and your catalog that exists you might go oh i want to i want to pull two degrees of lobe separation out because i want it to behave better down low or i want it to have a lumpier um, angrier idle and that's what i care about or you know it's going in a jet boat so it's not going to want to rev so we'll go down from 112 to 110 lobe separation and then it's only going to rev to four and a half and that's going to be happier for that and in a better power band. So again, really just coming down to it's so dependent on the application. You can't say there's a one size fits all. This is the lobe separation angle that you should be running. 
No, as a general rule, your naturally aspirated stuff's going to be on a narrower load separation than supercharged and turbocharged. But apart from that, it comes down to the yeah the, the two lobes that you're already using. And yeah, lobe separation is, is when you've already got those existing lobes. Okay. Because uh, it's just not going to be a custom design. You're going to pick two things and then work out where they'd react well together with each other. Of course, on a twin cam engine, assuming we've got some adjustability, we can actually tweak advance or retard both of the cams together which obviously will retain the the existing lobe separation angle but we have the ability to then advance or retard the cams individually which will then have the knock-on effect of adjusting that lsa correct absolutely yeah okay all right let's uh let's move on and talk a little bit about valve lash and it's a term you've you've brought up a couple of times and again we've probably got a, a bunch of listeners who have never heard valve lash so can you explain what that is and why we need it yeah, so on a mechanical uh, system, uh, uh, meaning one that's not hydraulic, valve lash is the clearance that you'll have between the lifter and the follower, uh, and the cam, sorry. And so that lash is there so that as we run through the different operating temperatures of the engine, uh, there'll always be a bit of clearance to stop the basically the valve from being held open uh, at any point, as well as there'll be a a ramp shape to that that'll mean that the valve opens nice and gently and closes nice and gently and isn't going to prematurely wear the seat or or the or the other parts in the system or, or bend things basically it's like hitting it with a hammer if you've got too much lash and that's gonna that's gonna break and wear parts and if you don't have enough lash your engine's going to cool down and your valves are going to be open and you won't be able to start it again so we're typically you're sitting around that 10 to 12 thou range on a lot of overhead cam stuff and and based on the the materials of the block and the materials of the engine and how they will thermally grow through the heat cycles as well as the heat cycles they're going to be sitting at and how long they're going to be held at, at high temperature you'll design a lobe and a and a lash and, and such to, to run that and what that's one thing that a lot of the times uh, people jump on forums and they'll they'll have learned from someone who set it up 10 years ago that they set their lash three thou looser than the recommended uh, lash setting and that went better that's that's not a good advice at all we will we're always sitting on the on the high side of lash and going with what the manufacturer suggests is because they designed a lobe that's specifically set for that it doesn't matter what your oem guys were doing which are often a lot safer than our than a race lobe uh doesn't matter what your what engine it is we've always designed those to be a very tight operating window usually they're in about two or three thou that it actually is running in uh, and so, or 0.06 of a mil or whatever that is. And so you're going to be needing to, to follow that cam card closely and, and stick to those recommended numbers because they are what you need. Okay. So don't, don't get loose and free with the, the lash thinking that you know better than the manufacturer. Basically just risking the longevity of your engine massively or the performance, because if you set it too, too tight, you're just going to have a whole lot of, uh, extra advertised duration for no gain. It's just going to sure. be a big lazy thing. Okay, so a couple of elements that I want to dive into here. First of all, that lash, I mean, you've just explained that, that it is important. And the other element here is when we're actually degreeing a cam initially, that, that lash needs to be taken into account because if we haven't got that lash set correctly, then uh, basically all bets are off because your timing events are, are based on the lash being set correctly, right? So that, that's sort of the process we go through. And if I'm right in saying some engines there as well, or some cam profiles, uh, you actually specify degreeing it with a zero lash. Is that correct? Have I got, is my memory serve correct? Uh, for like a hydraulic one? No, no, for a mechanical. I just had that in the back of my mind. I can't remember if it was maybe maybe a Honda B series that I'd uh, degreed a Calford cam in. And I think the, obviously it's it's quick and easy to adjust the lash on the, on the B series, but um, Maybe maybe I'm off on a tangent here and completely wrong. Uh, no, typically no. We we get you to set it with the with the correct lash. Uh, with something like a B series, you might set it with uh, a very little amount of lash. Then once it gets hot, you're going to run or recheck that because the lash will the lash will likely grow a little bit. Um, uh, and and we, we, wherever you can, if you can check your lash hot, if it's not a a bucket with a shim, uh, which obviously that you can't do much about that. You're going to want to reset it once it heats up because every every configuration based on the valve material and and the head and how it's run is going to is going to move slightly different. Yeah, typically there will be a lash setting, and there's the odd time where, well, like like the V8s, you you're not looking at the lash side of the of the system. You're looking at the lifter, so you're looking just straight at cam motion. We can ignore lash completely. Uh, we're still going to want to set lash correctly at the other side, but your timings. Don't you don't have to worry about lash, but the cam card will always tell you what your timings are going to be 
relative to Lash if it if it's relevant. Uh, in terms of a, a lot of, or maybe the majority of production engines, uh, sort of moved away from some uh, from a solid setup, and and I guess it's important to say there are a variety of of mechanical uh, valve train designs, be it uh, you know the B series I just mentioned, where you've got the easy, relatively easy adjustability of the the lash, say maybe with a push rod V8, and then there's the more complex ones where we've got a, a shim under bucket or something of that nature, which really requires quite a lot more effort to to adjust the lash. Uh, in terms of pros and cons of that versus hydraulic. Well, actually, before we dive into that, just in comparison, can you give us a, a brief rundown on how a hyd- hydraulic system works? Yeah, so a hydraulic system has a little hydraulic lash adjuster on one side of the rocker or under the bucket. And basically, as oil pressure comes in, it'll it'll pump up a little uh, valve inside there and close the lash up. And those are, are specced with the oil pressure to, to not be enough that they can push the against the valve spring or open it, but they'll keep the, the system... Uh, always in contact and have zero lash and that's that's a benefit in the sense that you've 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 always you don't have to worry about that tap it wear to the same degree uh you've got something that's always always in contact and always keeping oil moving around that lobe surface as well it doesn't it doesn't pull away on the base circle and that for for an OEM manufacturer for longevity is a really good thing, as well as ease of of setup. They don't have to worry about someone coming along and lashing up all of their engines. You can just um, slap them together and run them up with some oil pressure, and they're away. Um, and they'll run like that for basically forever in their OEM configuration. That, that's important as well because when we're talking about these more complex engines with you know four valves per cylinder. It's actually quite a time-consuming process to go through and and manually adjust the lash, particularly again if it's something a little bit more tricky where the, there's a shim under bucket or something like that. It, it's quite a big job, correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. So the the hydraulic, on the other hand, is essentially maintenance-free, which is why OEs like it. Yeah, that that's the case. Yeah, and it's um it's a heavier system, and it doesn't respond to RPM as well, which is why when you get to your um your higher higher revving and higher pressure systems you're going to want to switch back to a solid lifter like in your evo rally cars and stuff and when you're running um a lot of aggressive anti-lag and and shift cuts and you've got that explosion happening back through the exhaust that's going to prefer to be a solid lifter as well so it's not trying to pump that hydraulic lifter down because we can get to a point where uh, we get enough force in there that the oil just doesn't get into the lifter in time at the RPMs, and essentially you pump down your lifters and get a whole lot of lash, which is not nice for the system because they do not have a, a ramp at all on the on that lobe design. And so any lash is, is really hard on the system. So a, a good example of what you're just talking about there with the hydraulic just not being suited to the job, obviously my background sort of uh, drag racing and, and I was a bit of a 4G63 um, specialist. So you know, they run a, a conventional in stock form, a hydraulic lash adjuster and, and a rocker. Um, and under normal performance, normal circumstances, they actually work really, really well, and and they don't tend to have too much trouble even at high RPM. But where they absolutely will run into issue is with the larger turbos. We run a two-step launch control strategy, which is of course creating a lot of uh, big pressure pulsations in the exhaust manifold while it's spooling the turbo. And what's easy to overlook is is that can and will actually pop the exhaust valve back off its seat, even with uh, pretty significant seat pressures on the springs. And with a hydraulic lash adjuster, as soon as that valve uh, pops back off the spring, uh, pops back off the seat, I should say, uh, the lash adjuster pumps up almost instantly and then holds the exhaust valve open so you end up losing all compression. So uh, a lot of uh, 4G63 guys and girls will have experienced that. So that's just one of those circumstances where swapping to a a mechanical strategy is is essential. Shift cut, as you mentioned, does tend to do exactly the same thing. Even uh, the RPM control strategy if using ignition cut versus fuel cut that will have that same effect the other thing you mentioned there which i wanted to focus on is the ramp on the actual cam profile there is a difference between a mechanical grind and a hydraulic grind correct yeah yeah essentially a mechanical grind once again to take up that lash that we need for the thermal growth of the engine is going to be 16 18 thou tall ramp which is a just like a nice gentle slope underneath where you'd set lash uh, and it's it's 
trailing down for another uh, 30 or 40 degrees. It's, it is, it's an area of the lobe you don't use, but it's there to, to pick up that lifter and get him moving before it starts to accelerate up the flank. On a hydraulic lash adjusted uh, setup, you don't want that because you basically have 70 degrees of timing where it's just slowly, slowly opening the valve and then starts to go. So, so, so they, they basically have maybe a two or three thou ramp, but we do we want a little bit just just to give the valve a wee bit of time to get off the seat um, and not and not jerk it around too much. But it will have almost no ramp at all. It's just a smooth little design, uh, and and a little bit of a closing ramp sometimes just to give the uh, lash just a time to to catch up on the way down too, because we don't want to bounce the valve. Because like you said, if we as soon as that valve bounces again, uh, that lash adjuster will will pump it up and and think that's where it wants to be. So we want to just make sure they settle real nicely onto the on the closing side as well. Whereas if you do bounce a valve on a solid lifter thing, as much as it's bad valve control, it's not going to ruin the rest of your valve timing because of a, the, the lash, unless you spit a shim or something real bad. <laughs> Which is another problem as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's where your, your limitations come to the other side. Something that you can mechanically adjust is very convenient and strong, but it is heavy. You've got another whole a bolt and adjuster and everything in there. And so when you're at high RPM, that's going to be another bit of force on your spring that you're trying to avoid. So ideally, you go away from those. And, and every time you can get rid of a, a shim or another part of the mechanical system, that's another thing that can't fail, basically. And so in your in your high revving bucket engines, you're going to want to go to a completely shimless setup. But that gets to the point where you need an engine builder that's going to set all of your lash by actually grinding the back of the valves and tipping the valves to be the correct height when he assembles it. And you've got to really know what you're doing then because even as you're talking a head down, those those lashes change and move um, and you don't get a second shot at it really. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- this gets really deep really quickly and, and yeah. probably I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but... Uh, one of one of the things I, I give an example of this with our SR20 VE turbo engine. So this is Nissan's uh, P11 Primera VVL cylinder head. In our example, and it, it gets worse when you start using higher strength or larger diameter head studs. But uh, we we had the head CNC ported. I, I hate shimming these heads it's not my favorite job maybe I'm just lazy but it's definitely not my preferred uh, job so we we had uh, the guy uh, who did the head basically shim everything for us and that was all set within probably plus or minus one thou of, of where it needed to be and bolted it down onto to the block and uh, instantly there were about four valves that were now outside of spec that needed to be reshimmed and that, that's going to be pretty common and, and really th- th- there's no way around that so um, worth just sort of understanding that that is something that you, you do need to take into account. If you go to the, the bucket and shim style cylinder heads, you know, there's a problem there with that shim uh, maybe bouncing out. So um, for a, a lot of the modern engines now, uh, you can buy buckets that are actually a specific thickness. So they essentially do the shimming and you buy uh, the buckets to suit to get your clearance where you want. So again, uh, that becomes a, a more costly exercise as well because instead of buying just a small shim, you're actually buying a complete bucket. But uh, you know that that's the, the game we're playing. And the advantage, of course, is then there is no shim to fall out. You've got a nice, reliable setup, which of course is what we want, particularly at high RPM. Right, let, let's move back and, and get back on track here. And, and the other element that we really can't ignore when we're talking about the camshaft is the valve spring. And, and this is really, really critical. The valve spring obviously is, is in charge of sort of controlling that valve motion and, and preventing sort of uh, the, the, the valve running away from the camshaft essentially. And, and when that happens, some, some really bad stuff can also come out of that. So, uh, how how do we what do we need to know here? Is this a case of you will be able to specify the correct valve spring for a particular camshaft that you've you've produced? Yeah, absolutely. We always endeavour to make sure we've got a really good safe valve spring package to go with anything, especially in our catalogue. And we've got a wide range of valve springs to be able to work with anything custom we're going to do. The valve springs we we off, we typically deal with Pack Racing and their a very well-tested and well-known brand, and they do a lot of proprietary stuff for us to really go with the applications we're going to be running. But when you're designing a cam, when it comes down to the valve spring, it's about weighing everything in the system, knowing what your locks and your retainer and your your follower is, is all going to be doing, and then looking at the RPM you want to run it to and seeing that that spring 
is going to be able to handle those dynamic forces at that RPM, as well as it's got a, a natural frequency, which is, is going to be safe to those numbers as well. So basically, because the springs, the wire is always going to have a certain frequency where it's going to want to resonate. And the bigger the number, the better, typically. I assume you have to stay away from that resonant frequency. Well, the resonant frequency will usually be about 38, 40,000 RPM or cycles per minute. And obviously the camshaft's doing half RPM. So we're only looking at C, having it see four or 5,000, but any, once again, harmonic number inside that. So uh, a reflective wave at at a, a seventh of that will have a peak. And so every seventh hit on that spring is going to be cancelled out by the harmonic frequency of the spring. And they'll start to go slack. They'll lose some force at that RPM. And so we have to look at those and see that the amount that they lose isn't going to cause them to lose so much force that's going to lose control and so that we can actually rev past that point. And, and, we can, and we'll design the lobe to be a certain degree of aggression based on that and a certain degree of force. And sometimes it can be a little bit more lift, making sure the spring's a little bit more compressed is what you need to just have that spring better set up as it comes off the nose to keep this whole system under control. The wee valve spring in an engine is basically the most hard worked part. Um, a lot of the time it's doing so much to keep everything under control. If anything goes wrong with that, it can be a very expensive learning curve very fast, as I'm, as I'm sure you're aware. Yeah, yeah, it goes, goes bad pretty quickly and it normally happens at high RPM where there's not going to be a lot left of, of your engine, unfortunately. Yeah, when you're really on the cutting edge, you've got maybe 40 thou of clearance from your valve to your piston at TDC. So if that valve loses control or bounces, it doesn't have to go far. In terms of valve spring packages for performance cylinder head installations, you know, in the I call it the older days. I mean, obviously they're still around, but when when I was drag racing, the the go to was was usually a, a double valve spring with an inner and an outer spring in order to to get its a combination that was going to provide the pressure that we needed and also be reliable at the RPM we we're running to, which is at that time sort of ten, ten and a half, eleven thousand. These days, you know, again, I, I want to clarify, double and triple valve springs definitely still a, a thing, but for the mainstream performance applications, you know, if we're not going sort of too far normally we we sort of can get away with a single valve spring and this newer style maybe again it's not that new now but beehive valve springs can you talk <laughs> to us about what a beehive valve spring is why they can sort of in in a lot of ways do the job a a more sophisticated double valve spring package used to be required for uh yeah so it basically swings back to what i was saying before about the natural frequency uh, but a beehive valve spring will have seven or eight coils in them and the top maybe two or three will be slightly tighter wound. And what that creates is a higher natural frequency because it essentially has a varying frequency in the wire there. So you've got yeah, different natural frequencies on a single spring, which can work together to cancel each other out. From a single spring, you get a much higher number, whereas your, your old single non-damp springs might've got to 22, 24,000. Your modern beehives will get to 38, 42,000. Those sort of numbers are quite quite easily. And that's just that much more safety for RPM. The other benefit being that they're also lighter because you've only got one to deal with. And when you're looking at the mass of a valve train uh, affecting a spring, the mass of the spring itself is is a big part of that. It's it's a rather heavy heavy unit in there, and it's got to fight itself to get moving every time. And then ideally, conical springs, which is along the same principle as as Beehive, but they're they're getting tighter all the way up. Uh, are an even better way to go again but it's just the the packaging of those is so difficult because you get so small at the top end and you still got to fit your locks and your retainer and everything up there that they're typically not enough real estate to actually get them to to, to work but in, on paper there that's that's even okay. a better step up again all right in terms of the the valve spring you know we've got the same sort of terminology that we need to understand, just like the, the cam itself, we've got the installed height, we've got seat pressure, pressure across the nose, uh, also clearance to coil bind or you know, uh, lift to coil bind. Can, can you just run us through sort of really, really briefly what those terms actually mean? Your installed height is where the spring will be compressed to when it's sitting on the base circle, basically under the, ret under the retainer with no, with no force from the cam or anything yet. Uh, and typically that's where you're going to get your seated force. Uh, which will be uh, a lot of the times around that 70 to 80 pound 
or, or bigger for uh, racier engines, but you'll see those numbers on your on your box, and that gives you your point to set the spring up in the head and know that it's that it's going to be keeping everything under control based on the manufacturer's specifications. And then you've got your force, usually X amount of lift, so it might say your force at 11 mil lift, which is what most of the camshafts are going to be, and that'll let you know what it's going to do over the nose of the lobe, and you can check that that's not going to be too heavy for your specific application. Or, But once again, typically, we will be setting that for you and, and letting you know what's going to work because that comes down again to, to camshaft materials and valve train style or, or whether it's a bucket or a, or a roller, what it's going to need to keep that under control and what it can actually take before you start to fail other aspects of the, of the valve train. Right, so from the perspective of the person installing the valve springs, I, I guess there's often an assumption that we can just drop this in and, and it's going to be good to go. But that installed height uh, specification, that, that's quite important. So we need to go through and check this. And if it's not right, what are our options to get it where it needs to be? Uh, yeah, yeah, you absolutely do need to check this. Um, typically, the installed height we've specced for our, for our valves are what the... OEM head will will fit them in at, but as as soon as you've put different valves in or cut your seats or uh, swapped your retainer out, that that's that's all changed. So you want to measure what that's going to be by measuring by taking all those measurements off the retainer height and off the valve tip height, and then you can see where that spring is going to sit. And it could be it could be one or two millimeters out, in which case you'll put a, a thicker seat under the spring. Or if it's much too tight, that could be a bit trickier, but you can use offset locks or sink your valves a little bit further to, to, to get those back to where they need to be so that you're not going to be running your springs into coil bind or something. Because if you were to set them much too tight, you're just not going to be able to fit your cam lift in before your, your coils are, are bound up and solid. And that obviously won't work. Uh, so yeah, checking those numbers and checking that, that they are uh, within the specifications is, is always a, a good practice to do. Yeah, I, I think... There's, there's probably too many people out there just blindly hoping or assuming and, and putting them in and installing them without these checks that they're not that time consuming to do and and then you know that you've got what, what you're supposed to have and it just avoids any potential sort of problems down the track. So uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a non-negotiable. Oh, it absolutely happens. And it, on the same sort of wavelength, the amount of people that will drop a, a set of camshafts in and just line the dots up on on cam gears you know and and send it when it's that's you've you've skimmed your head you've you've moved to a different thicker he, thickness head gasket that's going to change your belt length on that side and change your timings all those things are like actually timing up off the spec card you could be a long way out on, on for multiple different mechanical reasons um as well as the fact that we don't even know that cam gears you brought uh, were made to you know a specification relative to the to the engine at all uh, they can be all, all over the show so the dots and the adjustable numbers on that are an indication once you know once you time it up and know where they are to move it around yeah that, i'm glad that you brought that up because that that is so common people just installing you know an aftermarket cam with a vernier adjustable cam gear even and just lining up on zero and and you know assuming that we're good to go but no it, it, as you mentioned there's so many things as a normal practice or normal part of uh, an engine build having the the head and the block skimmed just for two examples there that will affect that so you know it, it's a case of always going through the process it is a little time consuming but it's not difficult it doesn't require uh, expensive tools it's just a little bit of patience and and doing the job properly to degree that cam in, in the first place and then once you're there then go to the dyno and you can swing the cam a little bit and, and see if maybe you can move that power curve around but at least you're starting from a known base point and where that camshaft manufacturer has has uh, decided that that cam will work best. Now another question we quite often get is around the process of cam break-in for a new camshaft and uh, I think there's a little bit of sort of urban myth going around as to what's required. Uh, quite often we will see as well for a, a given camshaft manufacturer will have a recommendation something along the lines of you know immediately after startup rev the engine to sort of two and a half to three and a half thousand rpm don't hold constant rpm continually uh, rev the engine between those points for the first 20 minutes what's this all about is this a requirement for every camshaft or is it specific to the likes of flat tappet yeah give it give us some some information here uh, it's definitely most critical for flat tappet on a on a flat tappet engine 
it's basically always going to be starting up a bit dry. And, and because they're a, a sliding, a friction uh, setup, they don't have a roller or a, a bearing in there to to take that friction out of the system. They are just going to be rubbing parts. And so they'll, they'll be, a, for us, a cast iron um, camshaft with a Paco treatment to them. Uh, which is a basically a, a sacrificial lubricative surface, uh, which is designed to wear off in that initial startup while oil gets there. But th- you do just want to get up onto your RPM and get that oil pressure up into the heat as quick as you can, as well as with respect to a cam lobe, uh, the place where it's going to see the highest force is is over the nose. And the, when it's going to see that highest force is going to be at idle at its, at its low RPM, because that's when uh, you don't have any assistance from the valve train moving to actually to actually push against that spring when you're revving your lift is going to want to stay in motion and actually try to lift off over the nose whereas at idle that full force of the spring is just pushing on that and it's pushing for a long time mm. uh, which is where it's going to try and push through that oil layer and, and push through that shear strength of your oil and break that boundary down once metal's touching metal that's where that's where things aren't going so well once you've broken in that surface and got that oil layer going it can obviously handle idling at that point um, but you're trying to break off uh, like those small microscopic uh, layers and and let those two surfaces mate so that they'll have the longest chance at, at, at survival and that that running period is massive and also running uh, we'll talk about a high zinc uh, like ZZ, zddp oil uh, that's essentially a, a, a metal in your oil that will when there's a small scratch it'll it'll come into those holes and uh, sacrifice itself again to, to, to fill that back in and, and keep them good and goes real well with, with cast iron cams like that. Okay, so that ZDDP additive, because some, sometimes you can actually purchase this as an additive as opposed to an oil that is high in, in that zinc phosphate, I think it is. I'm not an oil specialist here, but uh, so that that's that's a benefit to add in with that style of, of valve train. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ideally, uh, purchasing an oil that's got it in there in high numbers is the best way but if you if you don't have that available based on where you are then an additive is is a good uh, second way to do that but definitely on your startup and your run-in period having that zinc to yeah help out with that with that wear-in process is is huge and, and back, back in the day obviously we had leaded fuels which did a lot of that for us but the zinc additive is is essentially trying to do what what lead used to do and keeping engines alive all right I think we've clarified that that is important for that uh, flat tappet style cam and, and probably just as important as well with that style of cam. If you're fitting a, a new cam, you, you do not want to be fitting that with an old set of, of used tappets, lifters. You you want to either start with fresh or you know, is, is refacing an option? I hear mixed uh, sort of stories about whether refacing is a viable alternative to just replacing them with new. Refacing is definitely still an option more for old flat tappet stuff like if you pull in your old 4k apart you can just get those refaced if you're doing a, a bucket engine something like that the the tolerances are a lot tighter and it's better just to get new ones although a lot of the time the oem follower will still be in really good condition and that can actually be salvaged the other thing is a slipper pad which is what we see in a b series or something like that they're very prone to to wear Mm. They're, they're the probably the hardest system to keep together because of the oil entrainment, which is as the cam is coming around, he's trying to drag oil with him. But there'll be a point where as that follower is going down, moving away from the cam and the cam is coming around, the oil velocity will basically be a net zero. And at that point, you've got one piece of oil just trying to do all the work. And you'll see that on, on your lifters often there'll be like a, a line where it's worn slightly worse than anywhere else. And so refacing those and making sure those are, are don't have any any sharp points or any bad wear like that is going to be crucial to getting a new cam running again because if there's anywhere that is in a nice radius, it's going to break through that oil shear layer real quick. Okay. All right. So that's that's flat tap it for us. What about the break-in techniques for other valve trains? Maybe we've got a, a roller-style lifter and a push rod engine or maybe sort of a, a more modern you know double overhead cam multi-valve engine be that a, a roller rocker maybe it, it's a, a bucket a cam on bucket you know is it the same break-in process for all of those uh, types of valve train 
uh, in terms of the valve train specifically on a roller, it's not going to have the same sliding wear that you're going to need to worry about. A lot of them are going to be a hydraulic lash adjuster. And in that case, you want to get that RPM up quick to get that oil pressure up as fast as you can. A lot of the times it's going to sound quite tappity for a couple of minutes while it pumps all those up and you've got to just grin and bear it <laughs> in essence. But yeah, with a roller, no, it doesn't have that same level of, of break in procedure, but typically... It's not that often that all you've done is the camshaft. And so when you've got fresh valves and fresh springs and retainers mating and just getting everything up to RPM and getting a, a good solid temperature cycle, like a thermal cycle through that engine is going to be really good for getting all those parts to mate nicely where they want to go, bed in and bed in really well. Even if it's a roller or regardless of you know what type of valve train it's got, it's just good practice. Uh, yes, essentially you could you could probably cut a few corners if you're just doing a roller cam, but for, for for saving 20 minutes it is a better practice to do it you know and and take the time where where i sort of find that the issue sometimes comes in is when you've got a, a full sort of ground up rebuild of everything sometimes the cam braking process is kind of at odds a little bit with my own preferred uh, engine braking process and by by this i'm talking about the process we use to to bed the rings and uh, aside from everything else that's in the engine, really, it's the rings is the primary aspect that we're trying to, to bed against that fresh home pattern of the bores. We've got a, a relatively limited window that we want to do that, and the process I go through is quite specific. So sometimes that the sort of flies a little bit in the face of what we would do uh, purely with the cam, but you know, some, sometimes we're compromised, and it, it, it is to a degree just what it is. Yeah, that is a, a bit of a balancing act. Usually once you're at that level, you're going to know know your engine and know what what it needs and potentially depending what it is you can pull uh i don't know pull pull an, uh, a valve spring out of a dual a dual spring to take some weight off that valve train while you're bedding in the rest of the engine or um which you might do on a big v8 or something and you can find ways to to make sure that both aspects get the best chance possible all right let, let's move on to uh cam design a little bit so what was the process for this is is the software that you're using is that something that is uh, industry standard or is it a bespoke software that you've you've developed yeah tell, tell us how that all works out no we have a proprietary software that we've developed he's a maths professor in texas now i think but we've been dealing with with him for for a long time and he does our our doctor doctor software which is used for analysis of of cams and lobes and the valve train as a whole and then also our design software which is where we'd actually design a valve motion and have the software spit out a corresponding cam design that's going to be used for that and we've been able to get into that since the mid 2000s when we got our cnc camshaft grinder obviously without one of those designing a lobe is not much use to you because you can't produce it but yeah being able to go down that route has has taken uh, calford as a company major steps forward and we've since designed some some really cool custom stuff for uh, yeah lots of cool vehicles and, and companies around the world um, but yeah, so where you'd start with knowing your valve train and knowing your your limitations of that valve train. For example, a flat tappet or or a bucket engine uh, is is straight away limited to the velocity it can run by the size of the bucket. So essentially, the camshaft's acting as a lever that reaches out and and pushes down on that bucket. And as it's coming around, the longer that lever is for each degree, the the faster it'll push that valve down. If that makes sense, and so you can obviously only reach so far before you're at the edge of the bucket. And so your velocity is limited by the radius of that bucket. Um, and there's no way to, to fix that. You just, you've got a con design constraint that, that that's where you start. And so, you know, if I design a lobe that's uh, 260 degrees advertised, I can only be so steep on the flanks. It, it can't physically be any steeper or I'm going to wear this Sure. this valve train out and so we'll look at all the aspects like that and if it's a roller if it's a push rod if it's a, a slipper cam and then we'll put those geometry and design constraints into the software and then design a valve motion because that's what we care about we care about what the valve's doing the camshaft's just there to make it happen and so we'll design a valve motion and then that will take that back through the geometry of the valve train and spit out a, a lobe that we can grind onto our blanks and we'll talk about that process in a, in a moment. In terms of the actual validation, you know, how much goes into this? You're, you're, you're not really doing this yourself. You're, you're working with partners around the world, I take it. So is it a case of, of getting them to do some dyno validation of the profile and see how well that kind of matches 
what your expectations are and then maybe going through iterations or are you at a point now where the software is so mature that uh, it's pretty much hitting the mark straight straight off the the grinder uh yeah it, it depends on whether we've ever seen the engine before or whether that it uh, is something that we've we've done so if someone was to approach us looking for a something for a SRVE we're going to we know that valve train very well we've got that in the system we can just start straight down with the how do you want it to behave we know how those heads work we, we can work out what your valve events need to be and design you a real nice package to go with that but for example one of our recent ones was for a customer in the states with a McLaren engine that he wanted to take to couple of thousand horsepower turbo grind you know and so we'd never seen that valve train before and got uh, really well looked after in the sense that he had some engineering contacts at mclaren who hooked us up with all the valve train geometry from the design and so we're able to plug that in and then see see the whole system and, and really design a valve motion that we knew was going to spit out a cam that was useful and you've also then got a really cool team of guys at the other end going well, we know how this we know how this car behaves, and we know that this is what it's going to do. And then we're like, well, we know the turbos you strap and do it, so we can say that it'll probably really appreciate X amount more degrees and X amount more lift. Let's see if you know your your valve train can can handle that. And we worked back and forth with them to develop a really happy package. And so, yeah, the, the different ways to approach the system based on who you're dealing with. In terms of turbo versus naturally aspirated cam grinds, I just want to dive into that just uh, briefly. And and obviously, very, very different uh, types of engine here. One of the aspects that we have with uh, a turbocharged engine, which is a, a kind of a, a variable that's going to depend on your turbo sizing is exhaust back pressure which we don't tend to have in a naturally aspirated engine certainly nothing to the degree that we're expecting to see with a turbocharger so how does that affect what you can do in terms of duration and specifically overlap do you do you get to a point if your emap is too high and you're using too much overlap that is actually forcing uh, unburned exhaust gases back into the cylinder and sacrificing the ability to get a fresh air charge in there yeah, uh, it comes down to the efficiency of your turbo system and the the RPM you're running at and such. But you, uh, a lot of modern turbos, you'll end up with a, a positive differential where that you're actually got more intake charge pressure than exhaust pressure. So if if you have too much of that overlap event, you you can actually be forcing your intake charge straight out the exhaust. Typically, the problem with that is you're just pushing cold air into that exhaust system, and that pulls energy out of the system straight away as it constricts. At the same time, yeah, if you've got too much overlap and you've got the other option where you've got all that exhaust back pressure, it's going to want to be pushing back against your intake charge. And if you're currently wasting that pressure or, or letting it out, it's going to be able to revert back that way. Uh, so with a turbo engine, we'll typically have a lot less of an overlap event uh, and wider separation uh, on our designs to keep the intake and exhaust from interacting with each other. Uh, I guess in, in terms of cam design, generalizations are probably pretty difficult. Is it sort of something where as a turbo gets bigger and that relationship between IMAP and EMAP drops away? In other words, we don't have so much exhaust pressure. We can use a little bit more duration and overlap. I mean, you've just mentioned that problem with actually forcing the intake charge straight through the cylinder and out into the exhaust. So obviously the, there's there's a balancing act here. But is that the case versus a smaller turbocharger with massively high EMAP where you, you'd want to keep that uh, that overlap period much shorter? Is that is that kind of the, the gist of things? Yeah, that that's absolutely the case. And with modern turbos with their with their better efficiency and that, that better ratio between IMAP and EMAP, yeah, you've got the ability to run something that would traditionally be much more similar to a naturally aspirated camshaft because your intake charge has got more energy and it is going to keep moving in the right direction uh, as opposed to, yeah, the older, less efficient turbos where the exhaust was always backing up. Okay. Right, let, let's move on and talk about the, the actual equipment for grinding these cams. And you already said you started with a, a, a manual uh, cam grinder and, and Calford then moved on to, to CNC. So, I mean, I, I can assume that the CNC gives much more flexibility as well as much more consistency and repeatability. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's essentially correct. We do get very good uh, consistency and repeatability off the manual grinders, but you're running a, a copy wheel and a master that's a, a previously ground, you know, set in stone thing. So you you can only grind what, what you've got waiting on the shelf. 
basically. Whereas with the CNC, you can design and put a series of numbers in and uh, it'll spit out that lobe. So if you want to tweak something or change something slightly or, or design something totally new, you, you need that computer aided ability to do that. As, as In terms of how they function, essentially they're the same thing. It's a, it's a large grinding wheel. Uh, that moves uh, on the manual grinder, the, the cam moves away from the wheel. On the CNC, the wheel moves away from the cam, but the, as they're rotating, it's it's moving in and out and, and following the pattern of that lobe to, to cut the material mm-hmm. um, and, and give you a lobe shape. All right. In, in terms of the actual blank or what you're grinding that, that profile onto, uh, I mean, I haven't seen it too much for a long time, but in cams where it's it's not possible to, to easily get blanks, maybe older engine design, something a little bit special, it's possible to build up the existing cam lobe with essentially weld and then grind that back. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. The problem we have there is that it, you've essentially converted something that was cast into something a lot more like steel. And with your hard overlay, it's going to be a nickel uh, rod that we've we've gas welded onto your lobe and it requires uh, sort of a high uh, ester mineral oil to keep that under control and because it's steel on steel once again if if your oils get too hot or for a second uh, uh, not not change soon enough and not really well looked after you're just running a riskier system but it, it absolutely can be done and as long as you're taking good care of your engine it's still a very reliable system but when you've got cast iron running on a steel bucket, that's a, a much safer system to go down because if you do get a little bit of metal on metal contact, it'll it'll rub but not fret and break down the way that steel on steel does. So those those built up cam lobes essentially you'd only go down that path if there was no other option. And obviously it's not a it's not a high volume production technique anyway, it'd be too time consuming, correct? As a last resort, yeah. No, it's basically done because it's more cost effective than making a one off part. A complete set of cams um but yeah it, it's not ideal you'd you'd go for a, a, a regrind if you could lash the system back up by pulling the base circle down or you'd go for a blank set of cams if you could find them somewhere uh, depending on what it is seeing as you just mentioned i wasn't going to go go down this path but it, it is worth mentioning so a regrind that that's an option for some applications where uh, you know obviously the 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 Lift is essentially the the difference between the height of the the cam lobe and the base circle of the cam because it's the base circle that the valve train runs on when the 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 valve's closed. So one way of getting more lift and the ability to add in some more duration is to actually reduce that base circle. There's some knock-on impacts with valve train geometry as well that would need to be considered there. Can you sort of just give us a, a brief rundown on that? Or how 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 good an option that is? Yeah, absolutely. It's dependent on the on the valve train setup. Um, if you're regrinding something like a, a pushrod uh, 4K, you're going to be able to just pull a bit of base circle out of it and set your lash at your rocker, and it's going to be fine. Whereas if it's something like a, a Barra, which is an overhead cam uh, hydraulic lash adjusted uh, roller rocker. Uh, once you pull that base circle down, you've essentially changed all the angles in your geometry, and so you want to shim that both sides of that rocker back up at the valve and at the lash adjuster to get it back to what it should be. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a, a valve train uh, that essentially is a completely different geometry and all asymmetrical at the valve and doing uh, who knows what, because it's going to be based on how much the grinder took off on the day. Uh, and so essentially with any regrind, you're limited to how much material there is on the OEM cam and what adjustability you've got in the valve train to, to get that back to a good standard. If you if you grind too much off, all of your radiuses are constantly getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so over the nose, you're going to be turning from a, a nice a nice round nose on the top of the lobe to a blade slowly. And, and there's a point where oil can no longer work in those in those tight radiuses all right well, let, let's get on to the preferred techniques and the ones that you're you're using for for the most part which would be a, a, a cast blank that you can then grind a profile onto i also see from some manufacturers i don't know if you offer them billet cams as well instead of the cast blank can you talk to us about the pros and cons of those those two options as it come down to material compatibility yeah, largely. So a cast blank, um, especially on a flat tappet follower, uh, is is superior as the 
it's got the nodular cast iron. So we use gray cast iron and that nodular graphite that builds up in there um, acts as a, like a bearing and a friction material uh, when those lobes and buckets do touch. And so what you'll see if you try to use steel on a bucket like that is uh, little points of, uh, we call it fretting, but it's basically micro welding. Uh, when it breaks through that oil, it'll just it'll weld briefly and then pull apart and and pull that material out. And so we'll see steel cams come in that have been run on a system like that, and there'll just be little chunks ripped out of the lobe surface. Whereas with a cast iron cam, you don't get that. You get that graphite acting as a lubrication barrier and wearing very evenly. As much as you still don't want to go through the oil, it's a much safer system for that style of setup. On the other hand, we absolutely offer billet steel for roller applications and systems where really high stress and really high force is going to be seen. When we're talking about that, we're talking about like the the big roller V8s and stuff that are doing, you know, 180 kpsi surface stresses and at the point where they need to be really high tool steels and stuff and spring steels. Some people will try and tell you that you're like your Mitsubishi Evo is going to need to go to billet steel, but that's not really the case. That's still a nice little roller with a with a lightweight valve train system. You're not putting a 400 pound on seat spring in that and really hurting that cam. Billet is obviously a much higher loss way of doing a, a camshaft. You've got to start from a big round blank and machine a lot of material off, um, and that's a lot of wastage. And whereas a cast system, you get very close to the finished size that you're going to want to need. And the other big thing to factor in is the hardness depth of your material Uh, so with gray cast iron when you chill cast it you've essentially got a piece of metal in that casting that's right over the nose of the lobe and it hardens that material all the way to the core and that means that when we're grinding something we can grind a a massive two three hundred degree lobe off that with you know 12 13 mil lift and that's going to just clean up that blank but we can also go all the way down to those little nine mil lift cams and know that we're still in nice hard material that's going to work well whereas when we go to a a steel camshaft induction hardened camshaft that's got a case depth you've got to be thinking about that while you're building the actual part and you're going to have to make uh, various size blanks for different bits because if you grind a a little lobe onto it you're going to essentially gone through that hardening layer and uh, if you haven't set it up beforehand so rather than that hardness going right the way through it's only just a, a millimeter or two three or four usually okay, three or four yep. millimeters on on a good mat- it depends on the material what it can actually do when it gets heated and quenched yeah okay but yeah if if you you're going to want to have you know different billets for for different grinds and that's just less economical again yeah I, and obviously the, there's a cost involved but on the flip side of that you're, I, I can only assume you're probably not going to go to the expense and trouble of having a cast blank made for a, a, a one-off application. In, in that case, a, a billet, or maybe we talked about the built-up or base circle grinds, uh, would be a, a more viable financial option for, for that application. Yeah, absolutely. And if you had to go to a billet for a single flat tappet engine, then you're going to look at surface treatments like your DLC Diamond Light Carbon, which you will have seen probably on some... Uh, followers we do it on some of our bucket uh, for for some of our engines but that is essentially the bare minimum you've got to do to keep those alive you got to because it it changes that surface from being steel to being something that is compatible with with steel instead of being just a steel on steel system yeah it's really interesting i think that the compatibility of the the materials is is probably something that is easy to overlook certainly i I wouldn't have given it that much consideration so yeah it's interesting to get that sort of insight into it yeah yeah it's huge and whenever we're designing a new thing it's what pretty much takes the most amount of time to work out what we're going to do how customers are going to want these to behave um, and how they're going to treat this engine and so essentially what material we need to start looking at uh, to get that to be the best thing possible for longevity and customer satisfaction at the end of the day makes sense all right thomas i think we've probably taken up uh, about enough of your time so so let's move on towards wrapping this up because my brain's about to explode on all of this camshaft information i've just ingested uh we we have the same three questions we ask all of our our guests to wrap up and the first of those is what's next and in the future for you and calford cams what's on the what's on the radar yeah definitely looking to the futures uh Interesting at the moment, I suppose, with a lot of the politics and stuff around green vehicles and electric 
where the uh, future of camshafts is, because they're not much use in an electric motor, is is definitely a question to look at. And we've recently brought in house all of our own manufacturing and all of our small components and stuff, so we're well tooled up to do lots of things like that. But I believe camshafts will be around for a long time yet with the enthusiasts uh, like you and I. I don't think we're going to want to go away from that that smell and that uh, bang of, of burning some kind of uh, internal combustion, whether it be having to switch to alcohols or potentially with some of the hydrogen stuff, I'll probably get in trouble for saying that out loud, but I think there's some, there's probably some cool aspects to, to being able to still do that. And the, the hydro mechanical systems of uh, internal combustion engine aren't going anywhere anytime soon with the enthusiasts, I assume, I imagine we'll be bootlegging cam somehow if we have to <laughs> if they get prohibited <laughs> i'd say there's a, a reasonably long and healthy life left in the internal combustion industry even though clearly you know ev undoubtedly is in our future but uh, yeah there's there's definitely enough enthusiasts that i think the demand for camshafts has probably still got uh, it's got a few legs left in it yet yeah at the end of the day it's probably only two or three percent of people who own ICEs that actually get to the point of looking at doing the camshafts and those guys are going to be just as enthusiastic about them whether that there's evs everywhere or not yep yep all right next question uh given the sort of trajectory you've had in your career and and obviously sort of got into to calford pretty much straight away and and you've stayed there but is there anything that you could any advice you could give to a younger version of yourself or our, our listeners who are maybe interested in following a similar path that would maybe uh, be interesting, help fast track that career or maybe avoid any pitfalls you've come across? Uh, yeah, I'd probably say the biggest thing was just getting that time to to bump elbows with the, with the old boys in the, in the industry. There's an absolute wealth of knowledge out there, getting that background and getting them to, to be able to sit down and talk with the people who have, who have gone before in the industry and, and learn learn from what they've done and learn from uh, the mistakes a lot of the time uh, and to be able to to be able to build your career from there has has been great for me just really asking the right questions and yeah getting amongst it and learning how engines work and what they've you know where where they've run into issues and where they've run into limitations so that you can uh, design and develop things to with with the modern materials and modern control systems we have we can go so much further and and really fix some of those problems that are historically been you know hard to overcome yeah yeah i I think in terms of you know internal combustion technology obviously everything continues to march on but it it is really important if you're if you're new into the industry you sort of think that uh you know you you know everything there is to know it's a bit of that dunning kruger effect that comes in and um you know Within reason, there's nothing really new there, and and understanding that there are people that have gone before who have probably forgotten more than than we'll ever know, and uh, you know, leveraging off their knowledge and and trying to avoid making the same old mistakes over and over again, and just having an open mind to accept their their knowledge, because a lot of the as you mentioned, the sort of the old boys, they're they're pretty keen to sort of mentor uh, young up and coming enthusiasts as well. So if you've got an open mind and you're prepared to sort of uh, have a chat and, and listen to some more stories. There's a, there's a lot that can be learned. All right, last question for today. Thomas, if people want to find out more about your product, uh, follow along, where are they best to do so? Uh, yeah, calfordcams.com would be our major website, but we also have a good uh, marketing crew on Facebook and stuff now. So we're putting out a lot of what we're doing and you'll see a lot of the cool engines and drag races and stuff around the world that are running our products and going really good on a day-to-day basis but yeah also pick up the phone we're always available on our helplines with technical advice and and assistance for anyone from from whatever stage you are in your build or or your uh journey into into motorsport and and we're happy to help out with uh setting you up with yeah real cool parts and some world leading advice and we believe we're yeah the got some of the best catalog and package of what we do in the world so Perfect. Always keen to help with with the customers. Yeah, I mean, I've been a, a long time user of Calford cams, and you know, your products have been in in the lights of my drag car when I set my world record, and I've had first hand experience. I mean, it is refreshing to see a, a New Zealand company 
that's now just up the road from us essentially uh, really operating at a world class level so congratulations on uh, all your success to date and uh, we look forward to seeing more in the future and hopefully the information in today's podcast has is, is opened a few eyes to our listeners on, on what actually goes into uh, these parts and you know, again just coming back to my first point it's, it's not always a case of just going to the, the bottom of the catalogue and choosing the biggest ugliest cam uh, available there's a lot more that goes into it so yeah Thanks again, Thomas. Been a great chat. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Thomas, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt anywhere in the world. Also, this is a great place to ask any questions you might have too and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week, a big shout out to Vlad, who has said, a podcast for car people. There are a few automotive centric podcasts and some of them have a really hard time catering for the guys looking to learn something or getting any value out of them, but not HPA. This show interviews people with vast and prestigious backgrounds in the automotive industry and motorsport. Every episode, I learn something that I can apply to my own build and work mindset. The episodes go into how and why people do what they do and what they've learned along the way. There are also names you know or have heard of so definitely the wealth of information is something you wouldn't want to miss regardless of your place in the car world well thanks for the kind words there Vlad great to hear that you're enjoying the podcast get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details and we'll fire off a fresh tea straight out to you all right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.